Missouri Mule, now Bo, was the Castro's first gay bar, opening in 1963. Since then, the Castro has become a historical landmark for LGBT rights and remains a popular hotspot for gay bars and businesses for over 40 years. Without warning, during the climax of the Gay Liberation Front of the 1970s, this borough became the hunting ground for one of the most mysterious serial killers in California history. The cause of this horrific killer's assaults on the LGBT community would be due to the effects of homosexual indignity. Indignity from a shamed gay community and an embarrassed police force as a whole. There is very little information available about this forgotten case. Out of the outrageous number of gay homicides in San Francisco at the time, one can only speculate who fell victim. Only the gay newsletters of the time can hint at the possibilities and tell the story of what the gay community experienced during this killer's reign of terror between 1974 and 1975. Inspectors claim the murderer is responsible for leaving six men for dead in or near San Francisco's Ocean Beach. It started on January 27, 1974. The body of 50-year-old Gerald Kavanaugh is found at the foot of Uloa Street at Ocean Beach. Death by multiple stab wounds from two different blades, suggesting that there were two assailants or that the killer stabbed with a knife in each hand. Come summer, John Doe, around 25, would be found at the end of Lincoln Way near Ocean Beach on July 7th. Stabbed 15 times with his throat slashed three times, the police had no record of the individual. The Sentinel posted a deceased photo of John Doe's face in their July 18th issue, asking anyone with information to step forward, even anonymously. Ten days later, an undisclosed individual claimed to have met him the night before at Bojangles before he left for the shed. The Sentinel would become the SFPD's best asset for solving gay crimes in the years to come. Klaus Christmann of Germany left his wife and two children widowed. The fact that he was a foreign traveler visiting a friend suggested that he was driven to Ocean Beach. Nearly a year later, on May 19, 1975, the body of 32-year-old Frederick Kappen would be found stabbed 16 times and dumped in the sand dunes of Ocean Beach between Vicente and Uloa streets. Marks on the sand indicate Kappen was dragged to this location. Weeks later, on June 4th, Harold Goldberg, 67, is found on the Lincoln Golf Course next to Land's End. Found by a hiker, Goldberg had been dead for two weeks. The eldest of all the victims, he is thought to be the last to be left alongside San Francisco's west coast. Five months later, investigators have a prime suspect and release a composite sketch in the November 6th issue of The Sentinel. Inspector Rotea Guilford states that the individual is wanted in questioning for several assaults on gay persons and known to frequent gay bars in the Upper Market and Castro area. Between 19 to 22, 5'10 to 6 feet, African American with a slender build wearing a navy type watch cap. The SFPD were directed to the subject when a witness claims he is often seen in bars sketching caricatures on napkins. SFPD gave the suspect a name, the doodler. Inspectors report the murderer was leaving renditions of his victims at the crime scenes. The doodler would sketch men at bars and restaurants on napkins, then give the illustrations to his victims as a way of luring them away to an area where they could be alone. By the end of 1975, there were a total of 17 unsolved gay murders in the past year. Inspector Rotea Guilford and Prentice Sanders are assigned to six of the known doodler victims dumped at Ocean Beach, while detectives Dave Toshi and Frank McCoy worked almost exclusively on the remaining overwhelming bulk of the city's unsolved gay murder cases in the three gay districts including the five murders of drag queens and transgendered prostitutes of the Polk Gulch and the six unsolved s and killings along Folsom Street, the Miracle Mile. In 1976, only 32% of murders are solved in an area of only 7 by 7 square miles. 66% of all murders in the nation involved 66% firearms, 18% performed by knives. 
less than 9% of the gay San Francisco murders involved a firearm. Instead, 66% of the murders involved stabbings. 76% of murders in America are committed by family members or friends, while the doodler was clearly a stranger to all his victims. Investigators state that the main reason they are having a hard time solving the gay-related murders is due to the lack of feedback from gays in the community not wanting to out themselves by speaking to police. On March 18, 1977, John Otis LeMay told his mother he was going to visit a friend named Dave in Redondo Beach and never returned. Through intense investigation, police found themselves at the doorstep of David Hill and his partner Patrick Kearney, a couple since 1967. The couple was now held for 28 murders across the state. Kearney confessed to murdering 21 gay men, but police estimate 43 victims. By July 1st, the trash bag killer was apprehended. This eliminated a lot of suspects to many murder cases all across California. This sent curious San Franciscans into a frenzy, bombarding the police department with phone calls, wanting to know if Patrick Kearney was indeed the doodler. After the media over the trash bag killer and an explosive Gay Freedom Day parade of 1977, the SFPD homicide unit decided now was the time to publicly reveal the unfortunate truth about the doodler murders. SFPD had basically already caught the doodler, suddenly responsible for now 14 murders of local gay men, possibly starting with Gerald Cavanaugh in January 1974 and potentially ending with an alleged victim in September 1975. Inspector Guilford had been investigating the Doodler since January of 1974. He revealed to the public that the Doodler lived in the East Bay and worked in the city. San Francisco was dumbfounded. The gay community was still at the mercy of a sadistic serial killer. It all started with a mysterious phone call in May 1975. A woman had called Guilford, gave a common name, then hung up quickly. Guilford followed the lead out of many but had nothing to go on. Ten days later, she called back irate with Guilford for his lack of action. She stated an age, an address, and an automobile license plate number, then hung up again. Guilford put the suspect under surveillance. Less than a week later, another woman called, claiming to be a secretary of a psychiatrist's office, the Doodler psychiatrist. She pleaded to Guilford, tried to assure him that the patient truly was a mass murderer, described in the papers, but that wasn't enough for Guilford to take action. Three days later, the psychiatrist calls himself, states that, beyond any question, his patient was indeed the doodler. The doodler had been expressing in detail the murders to the psychiatrist for the past three to four months. The doodler was seeing the psychiatrist for treatment of his mental illness, being gay, and the psychiatrist was indeed practicing homosexuality correction on him. In 1973, the American Psychiatric Association declassified homosexuality as a mental disorder. The psychiatrist's revelation to the police came at the same time California state legislators were debating a bill that would have enforced psychiatrists to inform authorities if any of their patients posed as threats to society. The doctor's claims were not only illegal at the time, but would not hold up in court. Guilford couldn't arrest the doodler based on the psychiatrist's testimony, but he brought him in for questioning anyways. The doodler was eager and excited to speak to detectives, relishing in the attention with a noticeable lack of sanity. But when it came down to mini murder, the doodler would plead the Fifth Amendment. The doodler denied being homosexual and claimed to have a steady lady friend.
Out of the 14 dead, there were an additional three survivors who escaped or simply survived the doodler's method of stabbing his victims. A European diplomat assigned in San Francisco, a well-known San Francisco figure, and the other a nationally recognized celebrity, all three closeted homosexuals in society. In May of 1975, the diplomat met the doodler in a tenderloin diner and took him back to his apartment at the Grosvenor Plaza. Once there, the doodler went to the bathroom and stayed there for half an hour. When he finally emerged, he told the diplomat the same thing he told the local San Franciscan and the well-recognized celebrity. All you guys are alike. The diplomat survived six stab wounds. Two of the three survivors pointed out the doodler in a photo lineup for the detectives. The diplomat was angered by his involvement in the case, but agreed to do the lineup if promised to be left alone. The San Franciscan figure left the city shortly after his stabbing. He refused to respond to SFPD through phone or mail. The celebrity agreed to the photo lineup as well, but struggled to decide whether or not he would be willing to out himself for the detectives and the gay community. Ultimately, he couldn't be convinced. All three survivors refused to testify against the doodler for fear of outing themselves to their friends, family, fans, and employers. Harvey Milk claims that at the time, the city contained 85,000 homosexuals and that 20 to 25 percent of them were closeted. The doodler is free, believing he is a cured heterosexual in the East Bay under police knowledge and surveillance. While multiple murders were terrorizing the gay community, the doodler managed to kill an alleged 14 gay men throughout the three gay districts. Though many speculate today that at the time, perhaps embarrassed by the number of unsolved gay homicides, the investigators took the opportunity to pin the doodler for killing more victims than he actually had. The doodler would be in his mid-sixties today. He is responsible for the most serial killings in San Francisco's long history. His story serves as an everlasting example of what can happen when a group of people are repressed. During a time of indignity, gays held in their secrets by not coming forward with the truth, and in the same way the three survivors and our defeated police force did too. Fourteen victims may never find their justice. Regardless of whether it is a blessing or a curse, that one of the most disturbing mass murderers in LGBT history has been disregarded and lost without justice. The San Francisco gay community, the SFPD, the doodler and his three survivors, example of indignity and the consequences that follow should never be ignored or forgotten.